I'm, I'm here with Ben and Nikki from Brooklyn band Bodega to talk about their new album, Our Brand Could Be Your Life. And yeah, we're going to have a like a proper interview that will go in the zine when they come to Bristol in October. All right, so first of all, how are you? Great. Really good. <laughs> Excited for the new album coming out in a month. Less than. How would you describe the album to a five-year-old? <laughs> Ooh, um, <laughs> let's say it's something you can jump around to. I would say it's cat, cat friendly. How T likes it. Yeah, cats like it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. We'll, we'll get our cat later and film their reaction. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you get yeah what they what they think about it if they run away or not? Take that fast. What do you really need? To be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the album is a like rework of your songs you made eight years ago as Bodega Bay, and you've kind of reimagined them in 2024. So how are they different now that they're part of Bodega? Um, they're pretty different in the sense that there's different people playing songs. So, uh, uh, and also we're very different people now. So we've uh, reinterpreted our current interests. Um, it was sort of my, not my intention to have the new one sort of become the official version of these songs or like replace the old one. In many ways, I hope the new one draws people's ears back to the original one. Cause I think the original one's really interesting. It's very lo-fi. No so, fi It might even be no fi So you have to, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's only, you know, going to be for some specific heads, but, um, yeah, it's like, I don't know, I, I, I love that collection of songs and I uh, had always wanted to do a more hi-fi version of those collection of songs. They were like the songs where I feel like I personally found my own voice as a songwriter. And in many ways, uh, it's where Bodega Consciousness started. <laughs> and the very first uh, Bodega album that we put out in 2018, Endless Scroll, I actually thought of as a sequel to the original Our Brand Could Be Your Life, which, you know, might be funny to people who, because they probably uh, heard that album first, uh, uh, especially in England. But um, yeah, that's so in many ways, it's sort of like we're like a movie uh, team here who's now bringing you the prequel to the uh, original. <laughs> yeah, and it's cool because I I started my musical career with this album <laughs> if you want to say that in 2015 like, I call it a career like I I personally I don't know I mean the American school systems are very different <laughs> but I had never done any kind of music study um before joining a band so uh it was like really fun for me to just kind of like try out my hand at music and have no pressure and learn you know um, and I, re I remember what it was like to have like no experience in like writing these songs and, and kind of, it's great to be able to kind of come back to that now as having like a few years under my belt as a musician and, and reinterpret maybe things I didn't get right the first time yeah. or, and also just to see how they actually held up, um, after all these years and how we still wanted the, the, uh, what we said in them to be heard to a wider audience well there's nothing like your first time this is why so many fans i think rightfully so uh cherish bands debuts because mm -hmm. even if the band got better musically or even if they got better uh emotionally or more sophisticated or more complex there's nothing like the first time because there's an innocence always there that you just can't fake uh um so yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, from the title and the singles that people have already heard, we know that consumerism is a main theme of the album. So mm. if you had to have a brand tattooed on your forehead, which one would you choose? <laughs> a brand? An ATM. Yeah, I would put our, our, own, own, brand. I would put our own brand. I would put a little ATM. Well, we're already yeah. there. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we're not a band, we're a brand. <laughs> <laughs> Which lyric on the album are you proudest of? 
Um, I really think the the song Stain Gaze, which I think is track six on the disc, is um I've been saying it's sort of like the theme of the album. It's about um I mean, as a as a as a someone who clearly loves rock rock and roll, maybe you feel similarly, but I feel this way that rock and roll is something that uh had sort of like I would almost call it like a transcendental power over me as a young man and really gave my, seemed to give my life purpose, not just as a, as a listener, but then it's also someone that wanted to partake in the culture. But then I started to realize that many of the things that I have held about rock, I was wrong about perhaps, and that it was maybe a little bit more uh, superficial and <clears throat> commercially stained than, uh, than I, Perhaps my young self had. That's had, the lyric, though. Yeah. So, well, no, I'm saying the, the whole lyric. Oh, okay. Whole, this, it, it it talks about. I almost see my I see it myself as like a missionary, someone who's in, in the religious sense, has inherited this rock and roll tradition, and I'm you know when I go on tour, I'm like basically like proselytizing it and uh, trying to convert uh, people to it, but also realizing. Um, there's many things that need to be upgraded about it. And so it's like, it's sort of like this crisis you have as a rock person of like inherited, inheriting this sort of thing that's long since the ship has already sailed long ago. Like we don't live in the rock and roll era anymore. <laughs> uh, I wish we did, but we don't. So. Maybe we do. <laughs> yeah. It's a new era. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe we do though. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Yeah. You're a mid-sized punk. You're carrying on the tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we don't yeah. know what yeah. <laughs> what the air is. I, I, to give you, I want to give my answer really quick, and I'm sorry we're giving very long answers. Um, I like in the second song in the album. It's called Bodega Bait, and That's the third song in the album. Oh, thir <laughs> third song in the album, <laughs> and the line goes like, um, we kind of um quote ourselves. It says, "This is new bodega song." And then Ben goes on to say that it's not going to be very long, but then the song continues for like another three minutes. So I thought <laughs> that's very in humor with Bodega and kind of like what you like, um, I think, as an artist where like in Shakespeare, the guy who, um, what's his name? Pro, uh, Polonius. Polonius, who, who's like... Um, brevity is brevity the soul, is soul of, of wit and then continues on for another few paragraphs uh, I think that's very fitting for kind because of brevity is the soul of wit let me list all my uh, things I want to tell you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite line yeah. <laughs> right what song are you most looking forward to playing live huh. well we've been playing them live for a while now because we uh we workshopped them <laughs> on tour the last couple of years I would say uh, probably the one that's still the most fun to play live is the song Tarkovsky because it has a long jam in the middle of it with a, uh, a pretty cool guitar solo that our uh, guitar player Dan Ryan plays. So it's always fun to do that because we also we improvise uh, that chunk as well. So, you know, it's, all, it's always fun to play something that's going to be a little bit different every night. Yeah. Yeah. I like the song G and D D I think women tend to respond to that really really well, which makes me happy. Um uh every time I get off stage, someone comes up to me and is like, What is that song? Where can I find it? So it's really good to actually finally have it out in the world where people can listen to it. The album skips a lot between genres. You get like disco, pop, shoegaze. To me it feels like the soundtracks or just like the playlists at like a party. Mm -hmm. So does that come from the fact that you're mixing Bodega and Bodega Bay? Yeah. Also, <clears throat> the it's sort of like a concept album about the state of, for lack of a better term, like independent uh, rock and roll. So it's sort of like functions as a tour through like our influences. So yeah, like you said, there's some shoegaze, there's some post-punk, there's some like American indie-ish, like R.E.M.-ish -E or pavement-y kind of stuff. And uh, it's meant to be like, yeah, it's meant to feel like a mixtape of uh, all different kinds of songs. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like how people listen to music today, right? Mm -hmm. when, when you share music with people, it's usually a playlist over a full album. Um, it's kind of just like in the direction of, I think, how we 
how we listen. And it was kind of interesting to to not limit ourselves in that way. Yeah, like my, my favorite records are often, um, I got, you know, they're like, ideally speaking, they're like two kinds of albums. There's one that's like an exact, uh, really neat, tidy uh, presentation of one particular idea. That would be like, I don't know, the first Ramones album or like certain David Bowie albums or something where they're like really exploring one tone and one aesthetic. Uh, or there's like there's like Beatles White Album or something where it's like every song feels like it's kind of from a different band. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, it's obviously we're like kind of doing that version. Well, tell song. me, how do you listen to music between your friends? Do you share playlists or do you share albums? Um, they're not really into the same like post punky stuff, to be honest. A lot of them like more classic rock, which I like. I just prefer like I think there's a lot of bands that can build on that that are newer and are still like releasing today. So there's a lot more to kind of find. But yeah, I sometimes send them playlists. I think yeah. So playlists, yeah, that's cool. Hmm. When you say classic rock, I'm curious, what do you mean by that? Because I, I feel like that means a lot of different things to different people. It is like Guns N' Roses, like ACDC. Oh, yeah. Just like hard rock stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It is funny how much ACDC has become such a prevalent figure in, in rock. Like Metallica opens up with an ACDC song. Um, do you know? Yeah. It, we saw them this summer last summer and they like have a you know um I, I can't remember what song it is we and we quote them in our own in our when we're on tour we say it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean acdc is one of those bands that uh for better or worse they've become like synonymous with rock music because they're like they're almost they're like the parody of rock music like embodied perfectly you know yeah so it's like i mean well, they're, maybe they're more parody to us and very real. For no, I feel like e like even the concept of their band, like when they started, we're like we're just like if you imagine like how could you describe the aliens what rock and roll is like they're like we're gonna do that. Yeah, pitch like Brian Johnson. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if you had to choose another artist to cover a track from the album, who will it be, and what song would they cover? Hmm. Oh, an artist to cover a track. One of ours. Artists? Wow, that's a good question. Hmm. I would personally just want to be surprised. <laughs> I feel like the coolest thing is when somebody totally reinterprets a song in the way that we didn't uh, even see the possibility of it in to begin with. So I wouldn't want to prescribe any one, that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I would like to be surprised. And, and then so like, I would love like the guy from Brian's Jonestown Massacre to like cover one of our wordier songs. I just feel like it's such a different clash of forms. Like I would love to see how he would, <laughs> how he would like jam it out, you know? Cause we are very particular in our like, you know, like getting like every beat, every note kind of Over, like- Overdub the sitar. Overdub, yeah. <laughs> I just think it would be kind of hilarious if he like did like dedicated or something. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I'm gonna change my answer. I would hope that uh Taylor Swift would cover one of, one of our songs. <laughs> so so we can uh buy like a house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think even then I think we would just be able to like rent bigger. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> what song would you get Taylor to cover? Oh, um, Let's see. On, on Andy Andy. Andy. Yeah. Well, no, I think well, that's too on the nose. Oh, uh, yeah. What, um, I'm trying to think. Mm. Maybe one of the cultural consumers. Yeah. That would just be hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> cultural consumer part two, Taylor Swift, Taylor's version. Yeah. Come on. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, maybe Culture Consumer too, where she's singing like she's I can't like, the audience believe too. in yeah. the fact that you have not heard that. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be funny. Right. What was the hardest part of the album to finish? Uh, the hardest thing for me is just finishing it because <laughs> yeah. I'm a tweaker. So there's many, 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 many revisions, which uh, 
a lot of a lot of people like at our label and stuff right we don't we don't really think this makes a difference to bring up the base one, one db one one or two db like, to me it, it felt different so but i realized about myself is that happiness as a musician for me is just working on stuff so it's always hard to finish an album because then you don't have anything to work on but but then you just immediately start working on the next thing but uh yeah the hardest is definitely getting ben to stop for like the the uh success of the business <laughs> he'll, he'll rack up thousands and thousands of dollars just to get that one snare hit perfect <laughs> we're tweaker yeah yeah have you recorded have you like made it have you made music do you have a band uh no no my friend's got a fancy loop pedal so we've done a bit on that but nothing like proper uh -huh. like recording yeah that's a good way to start do you play music oh uh, yeah i've got a bass over there oh nice. wow nice. how many strings uh, four okay <laughs> you don't need more than that. Yeah, to the... <laughs> just wrong yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> right so i interviewed gustav the other day who oh, okay. didn't name you as one of the three bands from their scene i should look out for because you're not really up and covers and you're already up so mm -hmm. which bands from your scenes like would you pick that i should pay attention to the number one i'd like to shout out is this band called consumables who are uh i mean i'm biased because i just help them record their first album which won't be out for a little while but it's really good and uh i think everybody should hear that we're having them open our um release party show in new york so if anybody's in new york uh that's april 12th um does it have to be from new york you think or is just like any any kind of like a level um well, it's from your like local scene so yeah within like uh, um, good question there is a lot of good bands happening right now it's a ton of good bands um i mean i'm not sure if they're exactly new york based but my friend Haley's band sloppy jane i know she's incredibly um creative yeah it goes back between like la and, and new york but they're they're they kind of they're kind of operatic in their style and they're un um they um they take like my chemical romance as like an inspiration for their artistic uh style they don't sound like that though. unironically yeah they don't sound like, yeah but i just love um they don't write like like for lack of a better word their new record i wouldn't even i would hesitate to call it like rock music it's more like it's like avant-garde musical theater yeah it's really cool <laughs> it's really interesting yeah mm -hmm. and there's one more we said three said three and and Gustav too, but obviously they had named us, so I feel like we have to continue to pass the torch. <laughs> um, uh, I think we should shout out somebody that wouldn't be as hurt as much. I would like to shout out this band called Big Bliss that um, we're actually taking out on tour. And uh, next time we go out on tour in the East Coast, they're like a really good post-punky kind of band, but a different version of like, let's say the bodega flavor. They're more like moody. They kind of channel the more, um, you know, like the Joy Division-y school of post-punk versus, you know, the more um, hearty, uh, cerebral version. <laughs> okay, one band, like in final band, I'm sorry, adding fourth. <laughs> but we just saw them at South By, and it was funny because um, they're, they are a New York band, but we hadn't seen them. We only saw them at in Austin, Texas, um, hilariously enough, but the band Godcaster. Yeah, they're, they're an amazing band. Which yeah. uh, I think... Um, the British might like particularly they have like a certain sentiment that I think ooh, the British might like very very good band. they have two records out now and yeah I've I've been listening to the records but I yeah I hadn't it's funny I had to go to Texas to see them and I was like holy crap this band's amazing so yeah all right what are your favorite three seconds on the album three seconds three seconds whoa <laughs> pretty granular Probably uh, the robot voice uh the being the or no what's the color one choose your favorite color choose your favorite color <laughs> um yeah i mean that's a really good question because as a as a music fan as as you know as well you know it uh, great songs often happen in like three second moments like a really surprising chord change or a really great turn a phrase in the lyric and it is those three seconds that really you know make your hair stand up or something so i don't know i'd say maybe yeah i don't know tough to say 
I think the very first track, uh, dedicated the dedicated. There's one particular moment where there's a there's a key change that always uh, gets me. At even even you know, it's weird to say that because I made it, but uh, <laughs> like I was really I was re really I'm getting more and more interested recently in uh, changing keys as a way to not as like just like an academic exercise, but as a way to express almost like a scene change. If you're thinking of uh, the song is like a movie or something where it's like, okay, let's like quickly change gears here and and to do it in a way that feels justified. Um, like the Beatles were the best at it. So sort of been studying how they've done it. Um, like the, the Hard Day's Night album has like so many amazing uh, little changes like that, that just, and they sometimes they only last for like a measure or even like less than that. Or sometimes they, they last for the whole bridge or whatever, or middle eight. But uh, so the dedicated one has a cool key change. All right, wrap it up. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I would say Tarkovsky when Dan starts a solo. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's all I've got. So thank you very much. But... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we um we like to talk. So anytime. Um, I'm very impressed that you're you're uh, putting in all this work at your age. It's really cool to see. Thank you. <laughs> what were Don't you be pointing, honest. What were you pointing yeah, at? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, buy the album. Oh. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll see you in Bristol. Yeah, we'll see yeah. you in, in October, maybe. Yeah.